what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, so I told them I wanted to be a missionary. Now, I'm not a missionary or in the traditional sense, but I am in full-time Christian work um, and uh, seeking to be a witness for God um, in the public square of our nation, which is a job that I've done for the last 20 years or so. Um, although I, I may be moving on to a new job, I've been offered a new job, which is specifically um, in the area, working in the area of assisted suicide and euthanasia, um, trying to prevent it, obviously. Um, uh, but um, uh, I'm still going to finalise that, so I'm afraid I might not be able to stand on a platform next year and speak from an explicitly Christian perspective. But anyway, here we go. So what I want to talk about um, is the big picture first. And the, the, I should say at the outset that this talk is based on two papers, one by Professor Donald MacDonald, which is over Rutherford House, um, and you can find that on the Rutherford House website. I've got a, a link at the end of the talk if you want to write it down. And the other by Dr. Peter Saunders, who was with Christian Medical Fellowship and was just headed off to head up the International Medical and Dental Association. Um, and that was written for the Sola Center for Public Christianity. Um, and there's also some books at the back um, which Solas produced, which have a chapter um, on life issues, as a chapter on marriage, which I wrote, and a chapter on transgender, which David Robertson wrote, and David will be speaking to you in a few weeks. Hey. So in terms of the books, I'm just getting this out of the way to start in case I get to the end. If you want to buy them, they cost £8 from Solas. Um, there's £2 in the, in the thing. Or the other offer that Solas is offering is, is if you sign up for £3 a month, you can have one for free. So I'll leave that to think about. So this is the big picture um, of the biblical story, creation, the fall, redemption, and the consummation of the kingdom, the ushering in of the kingdom, which also involves judgment. Um, uh, and, you know, that's the, uh, that's the story of history, um, where you see the, uh, Jesus having the power, the authority to open the scroll in Revelation. It's Jesus' control, has the authority to control history um, and uh, to achieve God's purpose in human history, and that's what we will see ultimately happen. But we need to start with creation because in terms of ethics, we need to understand what God is like and how he created us to be and how we will ultimately be if we are followers of Jesus Christ and how creation will ultimately be um, once the Lord returns. So that's the big picture. And so coming to creation, what we see is that humans, Genesis 1 to 3, I know some of this was touched on a few weeks ago, um, humans are created as in individual relational beings um, with a purpose of relating with God and with each other. And we're not created in isolation from God or isolation from each other, but we're created um, with that purpose of relating having a relationship with God with each other. And we see in Genesis 1 to 3 also revelation of God's nature, his character, and his purpose for creation and for human beings. Uh, that's explicit um, in the instructions given to Adam to care for creation. Um, and then in, uh, also when Eve is created in the instruction, which I'll come on to next <coughs> as well, to procreate and to fill the earth. Um, so God gives specific commands um, to Adam and Eve at the start, um, before sin enters the world. Biologically, we're similar to the animals, but we are different. We are not animals, um, in that we are also spiritual beings. We are created in a different mode of creation from the animals. God creates man separately and woman separately from his creation of the animals. And so we're a different type of being from the animals. And we are the climax of God's creation. As you will recall, um, man is created on the sixth day. And it's after that that God declares, um, after that God declares things to be very good, to be complete, and then God rests on the seventh day. And then finally, we're made in the image of God, with a special nature and inherent dignity. And in terms of our understanding of human dignity, this is where, as Christians, and as Western society actually, for, for many centuries, we have found the root, the foundation, it's the creation of human beings as being in the image of God. And when we see a society that rejects that, um, as we have seen in 20th century history, 
then, and as we saw in the ancient world as well, and all the empires of the ancient world, what happens is, is that people are exploited, people are abused, um, power, the people who are in power um, look after themselves and their own interests, <coughs> and they use up, exploit and use other people. So here's a quote from Peter Singer, who is an atheist philosopher, um, uh, I'm not advocating what he says, I'm just putting it up there so that you can see the opposite philosophical position that we are engaged in debating with. And this is, I would suggest, is the, is the philosophical position that lies behind much of the push for the legalisation of assisted suicide and euthanasia. He says, we can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation <coughs> made in the image of God. Once the religious mumbo-jumbo surrounding the term human has been stripped away, we may continue to see normal members of our species as possessing greater qualities of rationality, self-consciousness, communication, and so on than members of other, any other species, but we will not regard as sacrosanct the life of every member of our species, no matter how limited its capacity for intelligent or even conscious life may be. If we can put aside the obsolete and erroneous notion of the sanctity of all human life, we may start to look at human life as it really is, um, at the quality of human life that each human being has or can achieve. Um, and this essentially is, is, is the philosophy that lies behind the current push from secular humanists in particular for legalisation of assisted suicide and euthanasia. But I'm going to go back to my previous warning that in history we have seen that philosophy dominate in Nazi Germany, in Soviet Russia. And the consequences of that philosophy in the position, the corridors of power, being believed and pursued in the corridors of power, has always proven to be um, mass murder and to uh, uh, intolerance and totalitarianism. So, what I would like to suggest to you about this view is that it denies the distinctiveness between animals and humans, as we saw, which is in the creation narrative. It represents a denial and a rejection of the image of God in creation. And this is, of course, a human. <coughs> Peter Singer is a human being. He's speaking from an atheist perspective. But what I want to do, suggest to you is to go behind the human and say, what is Satan's purpose as he uses people, whether they perceive it or not? What Satan's purpose in history and in, is to do is to corrupt or eliminate the image of God. Because he cannot usurp God's throne, so he goes after the image of God in creation in many ways. And I think this is what it's meant to be in other ways as well as you go through this series. And it's motivated by a deep-seated hatred of the image of God, because he hates God. And so he hates the image of God. He desires his own image to be displayed instead, um, so that he can be worshipped. And I think that you see that in the in Revelation of the the story of the beast, where Satan gives him his authority and power. And then that results in the worship of Satan. Um, ultimately, that hatred is motivated by his pride, his jealousy, and his fear and certainty of judgment. Because he knows, um, he knows the word of God, and he knows what the end of the story is. But despite that, God continues to display his image in creation, and he will bring his plans to fulfillment. That's an absolute certainty. Um, you know, in Isaiah talks about the zeal of the Lord will fulfill this. You know, it's not our efforts that will fulfill the coming end of the kingdom, although obviously our work, we work towards that and we have a responsibility and a role to play, but it's God's purpose that will achieve the, the coming end of the kingdom and God's work. So the image of God then, um, traditionally, there are various ways in which we can understand this. It probably encapsulates all of these aspects, actually. Um, spirituality, righteousness, or goodness, rationality, creativity. But what I really want to focus on is the relational aspect of God's nature, both this week and next week. Because God is triune. There is a relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And God created humanity and the universe in order to have a relationship with the creatures that he created, that he creates. Um, and we can lose sight of that, I think, if we uh, and, and easily fall into heresy of, of um, thinking that God is some way detached from his creation. He's not detached from his creation. You see that in 
first chapters of Genesis, but we see it most clearly in the incarnation of Jesus um, and in the promise of his return. God relates to us and he will relate to the world in which we live as well, and does. So the image of God then, um, we see Adam um, in the garden in face-to-face communion with God, um, in a loving relationship with God, and we're told that God is love, and so love is at the, at the centre of everything that God does and is, and in the relationship with Adam before the fall. Um, so it's a, a, a communion relationship. Again, we'll probably come back to that next week. We see Adam being given dominion over creation, being given a, a responsibility for governance. Um, he's God's representative with stewardship responsibility. And this, I think, is again where we come back to the responsibility of government, which we then see developed later on in Scripture as well, that human beings and human societies have a responsibility to, to govern on behalf of God. Um, delegated authority from God to govern. And then we see the unique dignity of Adam and Eve, of, the, of human beings, in comparison to the animal kingdom. But we also have dependence upon God. Adam is not um, autonomous, fully autonomous, although he has a degree of autonomy and freedom, but he's not completely independent. But he's dependent upon God to provide the means of sustenance, uh, to start off with the life, Life in itself is breathed from God. It's not that the, the body is created, but there's no life in it. But like Ezekiel, the, the picture in Ezekiel 37 of the dry bones that come together, there's no life in them until the Spirit of God breathes into them. So God gives life. Um, it's both body, <coughs> physical body, and spirit, um, reflecting our Creator, who is spirit. Um, he's commanded, he's under instruction by God not to eat of the tree of life. Um, and it's through obedience that Adam and Eve would fulfill God's purpose. Of course, they disobeyed, and so um, we know the rest is history. But nevertheless, human beings are created for obedience to God. Uh, this is something we all struggle with, isn't it? <laughs> it's not the right like saying, but, but that is what we're created for. And the great thing about ultimately the consummation at the end of of history is, is that we will obey God and we will not disobey those of us who are in the presence of God um, and it will be all through the power of God that enables that to happen. But in the meantime, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're called to strive towards obedience. But Adam is created um, uh, to obey God. And then he is called also to display the image of God in creation to creation, not just to the animals, but also, I would suggest, to uh, the spiritual powers as well. Um, Adam, other uh, human beings, are called to display that image. And finally, he's accountable. He's held accountable as is he, as is the serpent, ultimately, as well. For when they sin, when they disobey God, there's an accountability there. And these principles all still apply. They apply throughout the history of the human race. Um, and they apply to us today, and they apply to our government today. Um, and our politicians, and they apply to us as individuals as well, and to our churches as well. Um, there are principles that are quite often set aside because they're inconvenient for us. And uh, I'm sure as we go through this series, some of the ways in which they're being set aside will um, be discussed and thought about. So next, in terms of creation, we have created body and soul, biological and spiritual, in the image of God, this is a summary, with inherent dignity, with a purpose to obey and represent God, to commune with him and other people. Human life is precious to God. It's not, we're not wholly autonomous, creating our own identity, um, but we get our sense of identity from our relationship with God, um, and are able to operate, we're not able to operate in isolation from God and from others. But we do have freedom and agency to make decisions that are then accountable for them. So that's the creation big picture. Then we come on to the fall. Actually, before we get on to that, I just want to read a few verses, if that's all right. Um, I'm sure that is all right. I don't think I'm going to take you. Um, I'm just conscious that I've got a lot of slides, so I don't want to get too distracted by all sorts of... Um, uh, 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 very often different tangents. So, 
which I sometimes have a tendency to do. Um, but you see in Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Uh, and then this story goes on about um, uh, Cain and Abel being born, uh, Adam with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Um, and she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Um, she, uh, later she gave birth to Abel, you know the rest of the story. Um, and then, as I was coming, or just before I came here, I was reading this, and, and this struck me in verse 5, it says, it, sorry, in chapter 5, it says, uh, but it's from Adam to Noah, it says, When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them. Um, and when they were created, he called them man. Um, so, what I would suggest to you is it's not just Adam that's created in the image of God, because of course we know that Eve is created in the image of Adam, she's created from Adam. Um, but that the image of God is passed down through Cain initially, um, although then it's corrupted, corrupted in Adam and Eve, but corrupted in Cain in particular. Um, uh, but it's passed down through succeeding generations. And then if we come to the story of Seth, um, in verse 3 it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So the image of God then, Abel's been killed, Cain has murdered Abel and has become corrupted um, in, in the direction he's going in. I mean, they were all corrupt, they, they were all corrupted, but Cain is choosing, deliberately choosing, I think, to reject God's way. Um, so, so then the image of God is then seen to be t being taken forward by Seth's line. And of course, it's through Seth's line that Noah is born, and ultimately Abraham, and ultimately Jesus. Um, so, anyway, so the fall. What we see then is shame, deceit, estrangement from God, um, pain in childbirth, a difficult relationship between Adam and Eve, um, between spouses, a curse is put on the ground, work becomes toil, spiritual and physical death. But unfortunately, the death doesn't happen immediately. Because of God's grace, and because of God's purpose, um, the judgment is postponed. It's uh, like a deferred sentence, if you like. Um, they do die, physically, um, and those who reject Christ all die <coughs> spiritually, but it doesn't happen immediately. And that's God's grace, but it's also because of his plan of salvation, which is um, articulated right at the start of Genesis um, in the prophecy that the seed of, um, of Adam will ultimately crush the head of the serpent. So we have a disordered world, suffering, comes in, um, physical suffering and other forms of suffering, broken relationships, human cultures are subject to delay, uh, decay, sorry, um, although um, they can be, go through cycles of, of revival or redemption and then decay, but the long-term decline is, is set in place um, until the ultimate redemption will happen when the Lord comes back. Um, and Original sin comes in self-worship and the desire to define morality for ourselves. And I think this lies at the heart of a lot of these ethical issues is the um, idolization of autonomy, worship of self, um, and the desire to define morality for ourselves. And if you trace that back, that's essentially what was happening with Adam and Eve. And Satan comes along and he says, you're not perish, you'll be like God, why would they want to be like God? Because if you're like God, we are wholly autonomous and can define morality for ourselves. So the fall, the image of God is not erased completely, um, as I've read some of those verses, but passed down from the generations, and it influences how we treat each other, 1 Corinthians 11, 7. Actually, if, if people want to look up these verses, different verses, you can read them out. Um, as we go through. So when I put the slide up, if you can pick a verse, um, then somebody can read them all out, uh, read, read, read ones out, and that'd be good. But I'll read this one. Can you find it? Um, so, 1 Corinthians 11. Man often not to cover 
says that he is in for the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So you see the image continues to apply. Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, the image has been passed down. Human life remains sacrosanct. Um, have we to read Genesis 4, page 12? Have we got that yet? Scripture is very clear. Our society may have forgotten that. 
Uh, the church may have forgotten that in many cases, but it will happen. He said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea. So they asked him, what is the kingdom going to happen now? And he says, you don't need to know that. The Father has set these dates by his authority, and as I quoted from Isaiah earlier, it will happen. And we'll see a res- resurrection from the dead. Does somebody have 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17? A physical bodily resurrection for people. For the Lord himself will descend from the sky of command with the voice of an angel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise up. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up to hell with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Okay, so there will be a resurrection. Um, again, this is a, the, the distinctiveness really of, the, of our worldview as opposed to an atheistic worldview which should just see death as being the end is that we know that death is not the end and ultimately there will be resurrection for the believer and for others. Then there will be a final judgment on who? Satan and the spiritual powers of darkness and on those people, those human beings who reject Christ. Revelation 20, 10, 15. Um, We see a new heaven and a new earth with no more suffering, pain, (coughs) crying or death. Some of Revelation 1, uh, 21, 1 and 4. You know? The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur with the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and that we were seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, Revelation 21, verse 1, and verse 4, as you will recall, says about the being in the new heaven and the new earth, there being no more suffering, pain, crying, and death. So these are put an end to um, in God's purpose. Those who follow Christ will be perfectly conformed to his image. Some of the Romans 8, 49, yeah. There is no Romans 49, 39. 39, perhaps. Probably. Good. Then by the height of death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe I got confused with the 1 Corinthians verse 49, probably. Mm-hmm. You can go away as your homework and see if you can find out which verse I was. Um, and then, anyway, basically, would be ultimately God's purpose is that we will be conformed to the image of Christ, um, and so our, our we will have the perfect image of God ultimately, and with our new glorified bodies, we we'll share in Christ's glory, um, and so we. Um, it says that we'll rule with Christ, that we'll be judges, we'll judge spiritual powers and that we share in the glory of Christ. You can look up these verses. I'm not going to read all the verses um, because there's a lot to get through, but you can look them up. So, principles then. The sanctity of human life, because we're made in the image of God, is dependent upon Him. There are limits on human autonomy, and we are accountable to God. And that applies to us all. We have a duty to preserve life until its natural end. We have a prohibition of taking life, and that implies also, as um, John was saying last week, there's a, there's a prohibition, there's also a positive duty to promote a virtue. Um, so we have a, a, a duty to preserve life to its natural end. And I would suggest create life, as we saw in the command which we'll come to next week again of God to Adam, whilst recognising the inevitability of physical death as a result of the fall. And we cannot get away from physical death because it is the judgment of God upon us. 
Uh, we may try to, but ultimately we can't get away from that. We can freeze people for a thousand years, but they're still going to die, or will be dead when they fall out. Um, so a duty to relieve suffering and pain, care for the sick and the elderly, Christians have been at the forefront of the development of palliative care for those who are dying and continue to be active in providing it today. So this is how it has been um, uh, throughout um, the history of the church, but particularly since the early 20th century with the hospice movement, um, the day of Sicily Solomon, etc. So, biblical perspectives then. Human beings are created to be immortal beings. We were not created as temporary beings, and our soul will continue even after our physical body dies. Death is not the end of existence, but people die once, and then we face judgment. And judgment, like um, any sort of form of justice, can we have a positive and a negative consequence. So if you work, it's just that you get your salary at the end of the month. It would be unjust if your employer said, thank you very much for all that work, we're not going to pay you now. So you get a reward. That is part of justice, part of judgment. At the same time, if you steal all the money from the company, um, then uh, not only you'd like to lose your job, you'd also like to end up in prison. So um, judgment has two dimensions to it. And you see that in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. Death has been defeated, but we should not actively seek death, even in the face of suffering. And this is where we're starting to get drilled down <coughs> onto the principles which apply to the topic today, in particular. So if you go to Philippians um, chapter 1, verse 23, um, Paul is talking about his own approaching death. And he says, I'm torn between the two. He knows that um, he will sooner or later be executed, probably, or die, and he wants to be with Christ, and a desire to depart be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, etc. So he will continue. God is not on his time yet. So he doesn't actively seek it. He doesn't say it would be far better to go off and be with Jesus, so actually I've had enough of this. I've been persecuted, I've been stoned a few times, I've been thrown into prison, I've been had shipwrecks, I'm fed up, I'm tired of life, I'm just going to go ahead. Well, he doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to wait and fulfill God's purpose um, and continue. The Bible is realistic about suffering, um, but it also presents it as an opportunity for our perseverance. Can someone read Romans 5, 1 to 5, please? And it calls us to love and care for those who are suffering. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. So, as a slight aside here, I think that this is very relevant to the church today in Britain because although we haven't really suffered much persecution, we are finding a more hostile environment. And there is perhaps a tendency to fight against that um, and to see that as a disaster. But Paul's approach to suffering, and he suffered more than most Christians will ever do um, for his faith, is to rejoice in the face of suffering. That's a really difficult thing to do. It can only be done with the help of the Holy Spirit, ultimately. But I think that's a challenge for us. Um, challenge as we approach the end of life, but a challenge in terms of other sufferings that we may come across in our lives as well. So we move on to biblical, more biblical perspectives. Murder, including suicide, is forbidden. And Exodus and the Sixth Commandment forbid, forbids all intentional killing of the innocent and then Jesus expands that to include even the thoughts and attitudes and words which lead to violence and killing. So even the hatred of the, in the heart is prohibited 
by Jesus, or it's prohibited by God in the Old Testament, of course, but Jesus began, develops a teaching for the benefit of his disciples. Even killing from negligence was not excused as unintentional. There's a story of um, uh, or a law where Moses uh, uh, gives to the people where if somebody has an axe head and flies off and kills someone, so um, uh, then they're held accountable. Nor was killing as hostility um, permitted even if it wasn't premeditated. So if you get in a fight with somebody and they, 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 you punch them and they fall over by the head and die, then you still get charged with murder today, even though it wasn't the intent to kill them. So killing was only permitted in three circumstances in the Old Testament. In a just war, which where God explicitly <coughs> gave instructions, for capital offences, um, and self-defense. The killing of the innocent is never sanctioned in scripture. And indeed, um, if you um, recall, <coughs> Judas um, takes the money from betraying Jesus and then he goes back to see the Pharisees and he gives them the money back and throws it down and he says, I have betrayed innocent blood. So, right, let's see what I'm going on here. Yes, this is right. God condemns and judges a society which is permeated with and characterized by violence. That's what happened prior to the flood. Um, Cain wasn't put to death by God for the murder of Abel, but following the flood, God authorizes the death penalty as punishment for murder. And I'd suggest that the reason he does that is because what happened was, from Cain, the whole of society ended up being corrupted. So that only Noah and his family, only Noah was found righteous and only Noah and his family were saved. The whole of human <coughs> humanity had become corrupted by the time Noah um, and violence was endemic and routine. Uh, you might think that there are aspects of our society and certainly of other countries in the world where violence has become routine. Um, Cal McCann will be talking about abortion, for example, in a few weeks' time. God judges that society. And, as I say, I would suggest that the reason this was instituted, this law was instituted at the time, was because, on the one hand, you have the grace of God, saying, I'll not flood the earth again, I'll not wipe out mankind again, because God will fulfill his purpose. But at the same time, there has to be a restraint. And one of the, one of the blessings of the curse of death is that somebody like Adolf Hitler doesn't live forever. Comes a point, Joseph's son, there comes a point where they die. The emphasis in the Bible is on limited retribution by appropriate political authority rather than personal revenge and excessive punishment of the innocent. And in the face of violence, Jesus says to us, to his followers, to turn the other cheek rather than to seek revenge. So, in the face of death, we must accept the will of God if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus did. See that in John 18? Um, if you can find it, has anyone got it there? I haven't got a sheet. I haven't put a little bit of paper in John 18, so if anyone gets it before me, you'll need to read it. suicide fall within the biblical prohibition of killing. Indeed, um, uh, Augustine in The City of God describes suicide as self-murder in one of his discussions on suicide. Um, now obviously there are issues 
and with mental health issues, with depression, etc., um, which have to be factored into our consideration of, of suicide. But nevertheless, um, the bottom line is that it is prohibited by God's moral law, and um, we have to rely upon the grace of God in, in those circumstances, which are very difficult. But what we shouldn't be doing is legalising assisted suicide or legalising euthanasia and endorsing it as a society. There is no provision in the Bible for compassionate killing or to avoid indignity, even at a person's own request. There's no recognition of the right to die, as we all belong to God and are made in his image. Suicide is always viewed either without comment or negatively in the Bible. You can look up those verses if you want. So we have two examples in scripture, specific examples, specific stories of euthanasia or assisted suicide. The first one is Abimelech in Judges 9. Abimelech usurps to his brothers to seize power. He kills 50 of his brothers. He gets into various conflicts. Eventually, some uh, <coughs> attacks a city and a woman drops a stone on his head, cracks his skull open. And in order to avoid the indignity of being killed by a woman, he um, asks, he kills himself, he asks to be killed. It's presented as just retribution because of his own murder of his 70 brothers earlier in the story. King Saul is another example. Both of these people are political rulers who are in rebellion against God. King Saul commits suicide ultimately, although the story goes on to explain that an Amalekite claims to David that he had killed Saul at Saul's request. <coughs> um, so what you see there is a suicide, but an Amalekite claims to have assisted in the process or to have euthanized him, you might say. <coughs> and this is treated as a capital offence by King David. So even though he didn't actually kill Saul, he's still put to death by King David because he claims that that's, and that's, where, that's what the evidence is pointing to, obviously. But these accounts are both descriptive rather than prescriptive. They don't in any sense endorse this behaviour. What they do is they describe what happened. But also, interestingly enough, they demonstrate the two main arguments for euthanasia and assisted suicide, which are to preserve dignity or autonomy and compassion and pain relief. So, coming on to the subject of euthanasia and assisted suicide then, it's important to understand what they are, euthanasia is where uh, a third party, normally a doctor, actively and intentionally <coughs> kills a patient, um, probably with the purpose of relieving suffering, and often though not always at their own request. It's not withholding or withdrawing medical treatment if that treatment is useless, burdensome or extraordinary, and it's not the proper use of large doses of painkilling drugs and sedation to relieve suffering. The issue here, the key issue here, is the intent. Is the intent to kill the person, or is the intent to relieve suffering by giving morphine or whatever, which then might have an unintended consequence of patient and death. Euthanasia by omission is the withdrawal of basic medical care with the intention of causing death of the person who would otherwise not be dying. It's not the withdrawal of basic medical care or somebody's already dying, which happens all the time in hospital, it happened in the case of my father, for example. It's the intent, it's the intention to cause the death of someone who's not dying. This is different than accepting the limits of life of our withdrawing hydration and nutrition for the person who's dying and leaving death. Definition is further voluntary euthanasia is to determine the life of someone at their own request. Involuntary euthanasia is to determine the life of someone who's made no such request. And interestingly enough, in the Netherlands, there are hundreds of examples. Uh, every five years or so, the Dutch government produces a report and they, they document many cases where there has been no explicit request for euthanasia being instituted. And then non voluntary euthanasia is where someone's incapable or not competent to make a request, for example, maybe with suffering from dementia. Assisted suicide, on the other hand, is where you give assistance to someone and then they take their own life. Uh, <coughs> uh, most notably by writing a prescription. A doctor writing a prescription for uh, a dose of carbohydrates, which the person then ingests themselves. 
as happens in Switzerland, or to aid and, aid and encourage suicide. So in terms of the debate, the issues are fear of suffering. That was the initial basis upon which the debate happened. And Peter Saunders says, in cultures that believe in an afterlife, the fear of what might happen after death is understandably very real. But in cultures like our own, increasingly dominated by atheism, the fear of the dying process has become the main focus. But in 95% of <coughs> cases, palliative care can address effectively physical pain and physical suffering. Now, there are some cases where it can't, not only to do pain, but to do with um, uh, 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 conditions um, such as autoimmune disease, etc., um, and breathing. Uh, uh, breathing and, and swallowing and these sorts of so symptoms, which are difficult. But nevertheless, in most cases, that argument about fear of suffering is easily addressed and is addressed on a daily basis in hospices up and down the country. Um, and then Peter Saunders made the point, the point, the very important point, that death doesn't necessarily mean the end of suffering. The assumption is that all suffering is over because we're only physical beings. But if scripture is right, and I believe it is, then we don't die spirit, you know, we carry on living in the spirit and there's ultimately a judgment. <coughs> if you look at the state US state of Oregon, um, in twenty fifteen there are two hundred and eighteen lethal prescriptions, hundred and thirty two deaths. And interestingly enough, if you look down this list you see that only in twenty seven twenty eight point seven percent of cases was the concern about adequate pain relief. So in the vast majority of cases, the motivation for assisted suicide was not pain relief, but loss of autonomy, loss of dignity, being a burden to family and friends, loss of bodily functions, etc. Or just not being able to engage in enjoyable activities. J.S. Mill said, the only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is a right absolute over himself, his own body and mind. The individual is sovereign. And this is the, the spirit of the age in which we now live, where we, our society says, if it just affects you, you can do what you like. In, in all sorts of areas of life, and we'll see that, that again through next week. But, human thought emphasising autonomy and the right to decide when one's life should end. It calls for the right of assistance to be given end to end one's life, which of course inevitably involves other people, if it becomes intolerable, which is a subjective understanding, owing to loss of capacities, pain, weakness, independence, <coughs> um, or ability to control bodily functions. It prioritises the quality of life and leads to value judgments being made by third parties about the lives of those with disabilities or who are in a persistent vegetative state or have locked in syndrome or terminally ill, etc. And there's always the danger that limited finances and the cost of health care for the elderly or the disabled will influence decision making. Uh, we're going to come to a case study at the end of the talk, and in that Supreme Court um, judgment or during the process of the, the, the hearing in relation to that judgment, the BMA quoted a figure for how much it costs to look after people who are in, uh, who've got a neurological condition and essentially said it costs something like, I can't remember the exact figure, but you can look it up, it's in the mind. They say, they say um, something like it costs £30,000 to go to court and it costs £90,000 to look after them for nine months to get to go to court. So that, that's danger, isn't it? that people are influenced by other factors. But no person has absolute sovereignty over all aspects of their existence. That applies to all of us. I am accountable and responsible to my children and my wife. I can't just go off and do what I want without consulting with them and vice versa. Euthanasia and assisted suicide involve other people. Doctors get involved. Other people as well, nurses, other people, lawyers perhaps. So you draw other people into the, and they become complicit. And I think a lot of the time the reason that there are <coughs> doctors involved is because doctors are seen to have some sort of moral authority in society. So it's about um, abandoning the culpability for making the decision and giving it to somebody else. Assisted suicide and euthanasia um, deny other people the dignity of caring for the suffering person. 
some people are called in life to a career in caring. And they, that's not, and the, you know, I was struck by uh, Donald McDonald in his paper, draws this point out. Donald McDonald himself um, is disabled and has a condition. And his point was that if he commits suicide, he is denying other people that dignity. Quality of life is subjective and difficult to measure. So somebody might find quality of life in a circumstance that other people might not. So we can't make quality of life or, or subjective decision like that the basis on which we kill people. And then the danger of manipulation by relatives for financial motives. This is always a danger there, and it's not always evident that that's the case. No one's going to say to the doctor um, about their elderly relative, well, uh, we should just get married for our misery because there's an inheritance of £150,000 and every week she's in here it's getting lower. No one's going to say that, are they? The legalisation of euthanasia and assisted suicide opens up the possibility of pressure being brought to bear on vulnerable people to end their lives prematurely. And that pressure can be either external or it can be internalised. People feel themselves to be a burden. Um, Alex Gill says it's difficult to stop liberties designed on compassionate grounds for few turning into entitlements for almost all on any grounds. On consequential grounds, I fear that by legalising active euthanasia, we will create a society in which one, the vulnerable will feel social pressure or even a duty to be killed, a society in which less than altruistic motives of many families will triumph. So, then there's the issue of protecting the vulnerable, and this is essentially the basis for which we've so far managed to hold off the legalisation of assisted suicide in Scotland. No system can guarantee safeguards that will always protect vulnerable people. There could be pressure applied from either external or internal sources. Many people with terminal illness also experience a depressive mood and they don't receive adequate psychiatric or psychological care. Elder abuse is an issue. Involuntary euthanasia um, and continuous deep sedation. In the Netherlands, more people are killed as a result of continuous deep sedation than they are as a result of euthanasia. Um, and euthanasia can be seen as a cheaper alternative to providing palliative care and other treatments. So there was a case in, in the US, in Oregon, where a lady called Barbara Wagner was offered um, by her medical insurance company that they would pay for her assisted suicide, but they wouldn't pay for her cancer treatment. So human autonomy is not absolute, it should not be idealised. We are by God and have a responsibility to him. The personhood of human beings made in the image of God and our vocation is to share the sufferings of Christ and deeply held Christian convictions. Our source of meaning does not lie in ourselves or in the quality of our life, but rather in the value God gives to us. And our dignity is inherent, it's not subject and can't be lost depending on our circumstances. <coughs> the demand to control the time and the circumstances of death is the ultimate act of human self-will. But Importantly, it has no power to overcome death. And this is the great promise and hope of the Christian. Not that we can control the circumstances of our death, but that we, can, that we are able, through Christ, to overcome death and be resurrected. Our value is determined by God's authority, our creative nature as divine imitators, and through faith in Christ. So, coming on to the last little bit of this section then. How do we approach death, our own deaths, and suffering? Well, I would suggest that suffering during or at the end of life is a test of faith. It provides Christian witness in the face of suffering, Christian witness in the face of suffering and death demonstrates the power, the purpose and the love of God to the spiritual powers. We see that in Job, um, where Satan comes before God, and to other people in Philippians 1, 12-14. Um, you see that where it says it's not, Paul's not specifically talking about death but he is talking about suffering and I want you to know brothers that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel <coughs> and as a result it's become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I'm in chains to Christ because of my chains most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of the God more courageously and fearlessly um, and I'm conscious that the, 
witness of my own mother when she was dying, and uh, uh, you know, of the even though it was a difficult process, and even though she wished to be able to be free of that and to be with the Lord, I'm conscious of the witness that she was able to have to those around her. Um, so our response to suffering is a matter of will, either the idealization of human will or submission of our will to God's providence. And Christians have a responsibility to care for the sick and the dying, as we've already said. I want to end this section by talk, quoting from Alan Irwin, who was a friend of mine, who was a, uh, in my church, and he was a professor at Glasgow University, and he kept a blog when he was dying of throat cancer. And about two weeks before he died, he wrote this on his blog. But last night, another challenge arose, and this is the question from Jesus. Will you love me? even though everything is falling apart with your body? Will you love me during the sickness? Will you love me in the discomfort? Will you love me even if you cannot eat? Will you love me come what may? I must say that this is a real test of faith for me that remains unresolved. And the test could be put as simply as this. If you lose almost everything, will you continue to love and trust Jesus? For me, the answer just now would have to be a choice of the will. And I think I find that very, very powerful, that quote. Um, that ultimately, in all aspects of our life, including the dying process, are we as followers of Jesus Christ willing to trust Him, um, even when everything else, when we lose everything else? So I've talked for quite a long time. I think we could maybe have tea and then have questions afterwards and then move on to the next section. If that's all right. People are happy with that? Okay. Okay.